progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we look to open the word of the Lord, continue our studies in the first book of Judges. Shall we seek his guidance, his direction, and invite the Holy Spirit to join with us? Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing us. We thank you, Father, for your guidance, for your direction, for all the gifts that we have around us that many take for granted. Help us, Father, to recognize that you are the giver of these gifts, that you are the provider of the blessings by which we live. As we open your word today, we ask for your blessing. Direct us now, Father, help our minds to be open to receive your word so that we may truly eat upon your flesh that which you have given and that we may become nourished by it. Be with us today. There are many things that are occurring. We need your guidance so that you and your character may be fully revealed to others with whom we come in contact. Direct us to this end. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, from the outset, a brief announcement. Um, I have an appointment this morning that's going to require me to have to get very ready very quickly after the normal time that this study would end. So I may have to um, look at ending the study about 15 minutes early. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay. So now, as we return to where we left off yesterday, And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. We were comparing this verse also with Joshua 15:63 and 18:28. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah, could not drive them out, but the, Je the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. But yet the city Jebusi of the Jebusites was that that was given unto Benjamin. Why would the scripture tell us that neither Benjamin nor Judah drove out the Jebusites? And why would it ascribe this value to both tribes? Any thoughts? Any symbolic item that might come up? I have to wonder in this situation <clears throat> how we can apply this with the movement today, because it's fairly evident that these two failures can be applied within the church's history. I would think that 1863 was one point, but we would have to, and I, I would have to consider 1888 as possibly the other. And 
Any comments on that premise? What were the Jebusites known for? Beside the fact that they were in they, they were inhabiting the city of Jerusalem, and the fact that God had said that all nations were to be driven out, otherwise they would become a snare unto the children of Israel. I don't know if they had any other direct um, revealed traits with the exception of the fact that they were not worshiping God. I mean, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Amalekites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, all of these had specific other deities that they chose to worship. What if the situation with the Jebusites can be applied against the setting aside of the 2520 and the rejection of the third angel's message? I mean, is the church today giving the third angel's message to the world the true third angel's message? Well, definitely not. No. I mean, they rejected the third angel's message. <clears throat> Continue to say that they are giving it, but it was rejected, so it's it's not even understood. I mean, I I find it interesting in this conference. There are those that believe that the third angel's message is now being given. And it's amazing that some of the people that have left the movement are choosing to believe that what they are hearing is the third angel's message. You know, that was the, the funny thing, uh, not funny in a humorous way, but when the issue happened in 2017 in September, when Parminder was presenting the nature of man. And, you know, Jeff had assumed that people in the movement understood the nature of Christ um, and, and the issues of 1888. But it was pretty evident that they didn't. Um, uh, there was a lot of people teaching all kinds of strange things. There was a lady from Eatonville, um, Tanya. Um, Tanya Beeman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and there was, you know, a number of other people. Um, and, of course, many of the people who were following what Parminder was teaching who had no idea of what the Third Angel's message was, what the message of Jones and Wagner was, or its relation to the Sabbath. And, and and Jeff sort of found it, I mean, I'm sort of, you know, he expected that people would know these things. But, you know, we had gone through the 80s, so we knew all the issues. Um, but many of the people in the movement did not, and still don't. So there's people in the movement talking about you know, giving the third angel's message in righteousness by faith, but they can't define what it is. Well, <clears throat> I give an example of my own. Mm -hmm. I went through the Adventist school system by choice. One of the things that has created some surprise and some consternation for me 
is that when I first went into the Advent school system, that first year, <clears throat> there was a teacher that chose to teach from the charts. And he was new to the, to the conference at that point. Now, at no time in the Advent school system was the time period of 1888 addressed with the exception of Washington state history since Washington became a state in 1889. Hmm. They did not wish to address Jones and Wagner. They did not wish to address righteousness by faith. They left those subjects completely aside and completely taboo. Well, many people didn't even know about it. I mean, it wasn't... Um, I mean, 1888 sort of became more of an issue in the 80s um, because of people like Wheeland and, and Don Short and, of course, um, the twins there, Colin and Russell Standish and um, Hope International. But otherwise, you know, it was pretty much forgotten by most Adventists. Well... I found it intriguing because I walked away from the church before Glacier View. I came back into the church after 2001. Okay. Now, the church that I came into, we would all ascribe it to be very liberal. It was not a church that I recognized at all. Mm -hmm. Prophecy was not taught. There were many things that went on within this church that <clears throat> are anathema to me to, today. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I gained from my time at that church was there was a very open discussion that would go on outside of the sanctuary as to 1888 jones wagner the aftermath of 1888 <clears throat> and all of the different teachings that jones and wagner and mrs white had presented now i i had a, a lady that i had become friends with after 2005 that had been part of the 1888 message study committee. Okay. And we were having a conversation via email one afternoon and she goes, well, I've got to move. I've got a whole bunch of these materials. If you want them, they're yours. Well, she was in Tennessee and I was in Washington. It's not like drive across town and pick them up. Well, <clears throat> A few days later, a huge box of books arrives on my, on my porch. And I wind up with a four-copy four set, four-book set of the 1888 materials. Mm -hmm. I wind up with different books by Jones and Wagner. I wind up with a whole bunch of different sermons, especially by Jones. And we continued with these conversations about 1888 in the church at that time. As I've continued since then, as I have been in different conferences, in different churches, all throughout the country, 1888 is treated almost as a pariah within the Adventist church, just as much as the charts behind me are so treated. So this is something that I agree. In the Adventist church, this is one of those, those topics that they really don't want to address. Yet, this to understand the true third angel's message, to understand really what righteousness by faith truly is. 
is the work that we have today within ourselves and within our own hearts. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the comments in the chat is that we should look at 2 Samuel 24, 18 to 25. Why? Why well, should we... I look, looked up Jebusites. I looked up Jebusites trying to find some info on them, and I found this. And uh, it's about Gad coming to David after David had blown it with, with the census, and there was a uh, slaying. And, and David said, well, what can I do to, to compensate for, for this great error? And so Gad said, came to, uh, that day to David and said unto him, go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor. And apparently Jabez means trodden down or threshing floor also means to loathe. Of the Lord, uh, in the threshing floor of Arun, Arauna, the Jebusites. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king take an offer of what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. And these things did Aruna as a king give unto the king David. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from the land. Okay. Now there's some interesting things in here. One is this is when David numbers the people. So he has right. this census that he does. Right. And... Um, now he repents right right away afterwards once he receives the number of there was 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword and the men of Judah were 500,000 men and um and then it says David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people and David said unto the Lord I have sinned greatly in what I have done but now O Lord put it Put away, I beseech thee, the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And then this is the prophet Gad who comes to him and tells him, um, uh, so where is it here? Um, he asks him, what shall be the, the punishment? So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thy foes while they pursue thee? Or shall there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise thee and consider what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning, even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan, even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. So this would be a three days pestilence, I, I would guess. Right? I would have to think so. And so, so that's the context anyway, when he's going to then build this altar on the threshing floor of Aranua, the Jebusite. Okay. So we have an example of failure by the fourth son of Israel 
through Leia. And we have an example of this failure through the second son of Israel through Raquel. We don't yet have a clear understanding as to why this failure occurred or what the examples are. All I'm doing is presenting a premise. So as we continue, and the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel and the Lord was with them. <clears throat> Why would the house of Joseph go against Bethel, the house of God? And the house of Joseph sent to descry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. <clears throat> we have this strange little word, descry. Why? What are we being told is happening here? It means spying. Okay, well, so if we... To, they wanted to scout it out before they attacked it. <clears throat> Why would the house of Joseph scout out the house of God? What symbolism can we see here? Okay, we'll continue a little bit. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city. And they said unto him, show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. So I would have to say that the definition of descry is confirmed by this following verse that they went to spy what was going on in this city. Well, this city, was, this city was not, they hadn't conquered it yet. Okay. So they're just going to conquer it. This is Ephraim, the, the house of Joseph. And this is, what, what's interesting about this, as, as we would look at this, When we go back to the story of Jacob, as Jacob is fleeing, as he is leaving his father's home, and he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. So here is Jacob naming this as Bethel the house of God. So he is naming, renaming this city before he himself is given a new name. He is recognizing that this is the house of God from the vision that he had the night before. So this is something that has great import for the children of Israel at that time. Now, in Joshua 2.12, we find the second witness to showing this man that the spies found mercy. And his scripture reads here. Now, therefore, I pray to you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye 
will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our lives for yours, if he utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. What story are we seeing here as an example? Well, for the story of the character. Okay, Angela first, please. No, I just said that was when Rahab received the two spies. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you were saying, Theodore? Well, yeah, this is dealing with, with the story of Jericho. Okay. Rahab. <clears throat> so the men that were before Rahab were spies. The men that are before this other man were also spies. We have spies sent into Jericho. We have spies that are sent to seek out and determine what's going on within Bethel. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. The man is showed mercy but he turns his back on mercy. Here we have Judges 126. Is this not an example of a rejection of the 2520 and a rejection of the third angel's message? Should we not take this verse as a warning? Yeah, he's building his house in another, you know, pag pagan area. Right. So what he's doing, he's turning his back on Bethel. He's turning his back upon the house of God. He goes to a nation that God has already ascribed unto destruction and chooses to build his house and a city and name it after one that has been destroyed and was destroyed before his own eyes. Yeah. Definitely says a lot. Is there any other symbolism we can take from this? Okay. Judges 127, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. Beth Shean, one, Tanakh, Two, Dor, three, Ibling, four, Megiddo, five. As we have accepted that there's nothing unimportant within Scripture, why is this failure of Manasseh 
important to us today. What I would suggest we do after the study, let's look up the names of these towns, their meanings, and maybe even compare it on a map to get an idea of where we are shown these towns would have been. We need to consider this situation because Manasseh as part of the house of Joseph was not able to conquer these towns of their territory. Now the following verse, and it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but they did not utterly drive them out. In other words, they made them pay, but they let them stay. Was that according to the instruction given by Moses and Joshua? No, drive them out completely. In our time, does that not mean that if we are to drive out completely the influences that are not of God, that our reliance should be upon the charts and Miller's rules for our method of Bible study. Yes. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell in Gezer among them. Notice in this verse, you have a past reference and a current reference, dwelt and dwell. Now, is that the way it is in the Hebrew? Okay, so, um, so we got uh, uh, yeah, I don't. Dwelt and dwell. Well, I don't think there's really a difference. It's interesting then that the the English translators would have placed this kind of a difference on this. But, well, they have to create some difference in English. I mean, I mean, they have to do something in English. Um, so it's really complicated when it comes to these types of tenses in Hebrew because they don't really have uh, they have a completed and an incomplete tense. Okay. So, and that's it other than they have the active participle, but um, so, so they just kind of willy nilly uh, choose to put it into some kind of tense in English and it always doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, now, as we have noted before, the paragraph markers that we have on these verses are to signify a change in thought. As we go here into verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahal, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries.
Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Alab, nor of Oxib, nor of Helba, nor of Afik, nor of Rehob. You start looking at this, and it would seem to indicate that the tribes are allowing the Canaanites not just to remain among them, but that they are they're situated among them almost strategically to their downfall. So as we look at this, from the book of Joshua, we are being told that, and the fifth lot came out for the tribe of the children of Asher, according to their families. Their border was Helka and Haley and Beten and Aksaf and Alamelech and Ahmad, Mishael, and reacheth to Carmel westward and to Shehorlibnath and turneth toward the sun rising to Beth Dagon and reacheth to Zebulun and to the valley of Jephthal on the north side of Beth Emek and Neel and goeth out to Kabul on the left hand and Hebron and Rehob and Hammon and Cana, even unto great Zidon and then the coast turneth to Ramah and to the strong city Tyre, and the coast turneth to Hosa, and the outgoings there are at the sea from the coast to Akzib, Uma also, and Aphek, and Rehob, twenty and two cities with their villages. We go back to this. If these are part of these 22 cities of Asher, and we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost a third of the cities that are named, if they were part of this that was being shown for the inheritance, would have been left to the Canaanites. That's a huge number of cities. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. So Asher did not put them to tribute. They just allowed them to live there. They're completely ignoring the word of the Lord through Moses and Joshua. It's like, well, I've got, I, I've got my little piece of land. I'll let you stay there. You don't bother me. I don't bother you. Yet the influence of the Canaanites became greater and greater. And the influence in showing the character of God through all of these different families became less and less. Is that not what we have seen happening today within the corporate church and within the movement? Yeah, if you allow sin to be in the camp. Okay. Could um, someone, could someone, effect. okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, so if you allow sin in the camp, it's going to, going to affect you. Okay. 
Could someone please read the current comment in the chat? I can't see it very clearly. Okay, it says uh, it's Joshua twenty three thirteen. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes, until ye perish from off the good land which the Lord your God hath given you. How can we apply this warning for us today? One way that I look at this would be that we need to accept completely the health message that had been provided for us by Mrs. White. There's a lot to this health message. I, I mean, I, I find in many ways that the health message is even less understood than the message of 1888. Now, why is that in particular? Well, We have often stated that the messages of Revelation 14 with the message of the other angel of Revelation 18 are truly the gospel, right? Yeah. The health message is supposed to be the right arm of the gospel. Yeah, the right hand to open the door. Okay. To that's that is it's an entering uh, to give the gospel to the world. Okay. How can we be opening the door of the third angel's message when we are not willing to conform? to the health message as Mrs. White had provided it. Well, so there's two things, because I was in, in the, the health work um, in British Columbia. So there we had a retreat, a health center, whatever you want to call it, guest house, they called it a guest house. And, uh, you know, the idea there is that you're going to um, – Witness to people, people who are not Adventists, they're going to come there and you're going to work in a practical sense with them so that they'll be open to the gospel. And it was very effective. Many people were open to the gospel. So it's something I witnessed personally. Uh, when you care for people's physical needs, they're going to listen to you. Um, and, you know, there's other places like that, Uchi Pines. Uh, we've had some really good institutions self-supporting institutions doing the health message but the church's approach has been uh, basically the medicine of the world i mean they're just modern medicine and they're not very effective in giving the gospel i mean and and, and it doesn't even seem like that's what they're trying to do um for the most part so they're just worldly institutions owned by the church and then you, of course, have the, the extreme. There's all kinds of New Age stuff. Uh, you, um, Agatha Thrash, the th Dr. Thrash, they had to fight against that kind of stuff at Uchi Pines, uh, where you have many sort of supposed health message uh, type retreats that are doing all kinds of things that are unrelated to anything that Ellen White ever taught regarding health. So one is there would be a lot of confusion for Adventists to even know what the health message is. Even in this movement, people are teaching all kinds of things that have no support in the spirit of prophecy. 
and and so it becomes confusing i think for a lot of people they haven't seen the positive examples they've only seen the ne negative examples on the extreme so So I don't, I, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a problem, but it's also an emotional issue within, within Adventism and within this movement as well. What do we find when we personally investigate and accept the health message? What happens to us at that point? Does the health well, that's what drew me, me to the church? Excuse me, Dwight. No, yeah, you're that's fine. what made me determined to join because that's what I was looking for. I wasn't looking just just for scriptures because I knew a lot of them already. I well, I wanted a lifestyle change, and that really helped me. When I when somebody paid for me to take a crash new start course, or uh, uh, it was uh, well, I can't even remember the name of it, but anyway, it was a health course. And I still don't know who paid for it. But even though it was only a week long, when I came home, I immediately started to put what I had learned into effect to the horror of my family. <laughs> I find it interesting <clears throat> that one of my former teachers in the Advent school system now goes around the country conducting seminars on vegetarian cooking. He and his wife for years have had a retreat in Washington, not far from the Canadian border. But I'm also seeing that there's quite quite a difference between vegetarian and vegan. But in these situations, I've had to ask how many of these are actually following according to Mrs. White's counsel, especially within the church. Because if the health message is the right hand of the gospel, the door opening of the gospel. Should it not be treated more kindly than what it is today? Should this not become something that we ourselves are studying and adhering to yeah. so the idea in the spirit of prophecy when you study about um, medical ministry um, she's actually talking about personal labor yeah is your neighbors um, co-workers um, where you have an opportunity to minister to people who have health problems of various kinds um, and sometimes, you know, I know some Adventists, they, they have a ministry which is basically uh, caring for those who are dying from cancer. That is, they'll go into these people's homes and treat them and pray with them. And, um, you know, often those people aren't going to recover. Um, sometimes they may, but most of the times they've already gone through everything. And even when I was at Silver Hills, Many of the cancer patients who came there, they came there after the medical profession had done everything they could for them, which meant that they probably weren't going to live because uh, their immune systems had been destroyed um, and, and they were also fairly far gone. They should have come earlier. But um, it's, it's something that, that – when it comes to ministering to people, 
it's very individualized taking a person from where they're at and trying to lead them in further uh, to something something better and and it's it's something that takes a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience to know how to minister to others Is this not something where we need to have more reliance on the guidance of God? Mm -hmm. I mean, within our own characters, within our own lives, are we so inclined to minister unto others? Well, you know, one of the problems I see in you know, let's say somebody has a health problem. How do we approach them? Now, what I've seen often is, especially when it's when it's somebody within the church, uh, we usually come with some kind of condemnation. That is, we might come with some advice of something that they should do, uh, which may or may not be good advice because we often don't have a clue what we're talking about. And, and then when that person is sick, we assume that they've done something wrong, that they're not following what uh, Ellen White said, and that may be the case. Um, but, but often it, it's, not, it's not redemptive. Our approach is not redemptive. People often feel uh, very much rejected or judged. And um, so it takes a lot of wisdom to minister to someone, um, you know, who has, you know, and you can even see with this issue with COVID, different people's views and what you should do. And if you disagree with them, uh, they can be very upset, you know, because they may have some suggestions which they believe are going to help. And, and, and so, you know, it's that emotional aspect of of this issue within Adventism that I find the most troubling. I mean, many people are just have had bad experiences with people who are doing medical ministry. I mean, we had the Dublins in this movement. They came up to Alberta. I mean, and the stuff that they were teaching was was utter nonsense. And yet people in this movement were following it. And we had the same problem with uh, Michelle. Uh, she was just getting stuff she got off the internet from, you know, unreliable sources. It wasn't. It wasn't the spirit of prophecy, and and that's the problem that I have. I mean, and I call it this stuff nonsense because it's not found in the spirit of prophecy. I've read what Ellen White says about health, um, and and people have all kinds of ideas and. They have nothing to do with anything that God has given this 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 church or this movement, and so so it becomes it becomes a problem, right? Because we don't know we're so confused by the world's health, you know the uh, the ideas that that come from the New Age, which have been molded and fitted. I um, mean, it's kind of interesting in the first issue of if you remember. Uh, the first issue of our firm foundation magazine where Jeff's first article that ended up in the time of the end magazine was published. Uh, there's a whole section or a whole article dealing with the problem of new age medicine within Adventism. And, and it's something that the thrashes have to address all the time. So, but we see these things being promoted as Adventist health. As the Adventist health message. So I, I don't really know what the solution is other than for individuals to study it for themselves and to understand the purpose of the health message, which is actually to bring uh, spiritual healing to people, to bring the gospel to them.
Okay. So if we're going to have to make this personal. In order for it to be personal, just like with the third angel's message, we need to spend time to consider carefully the elements of this message and how we can apply it within our own lives. It becomes a task that requires some effort upon ourselves. And I think really this is, this is where we will find the manner of study for us to be able to apply the third angel's message. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres, in Agilon, and in Shalbim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. So that the hand of the house of Joseph was heavy. And the coast of the Amorites was going up from Akabim, from the rock, and upward. Here again, as we studied several weeks ago, Dan was given a territory, a very beautiful territory, but it was a territory that was going to require personal effort and personal labor. They did not wish to put forth that personal labor. Is that not what we have seen since 1957 within the church and in the time with Parminder before Elder Jeff unretired and began to speak again. Is the application right or is the application wrong? What do you say? So you're looking from, so Jeff retired um, April 8th, 2019, and came out of retirement September 7th, 2019. Right. So what are you saying about that exactly? Well, I'm asking if we are comparing this to ourselves right now. Dan was given a, a beautiful territory, but Dan chose not to fight for its inheritance. They chose to go to accept what another had done. So you're saying this has to do with Parminder and Tess? And right. I'm asking that question. I'm making the application for the consideration and for discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dan would go and, uh, excuse me, Dan would go and seize territory that didn't belong to them, whereas. Whereas us in the movement, some of us, including myself, unfortunately, just took what Tess 
Tess and Parmender were teaching about while well, we were querying it, but we did take, I know I personally took a lot of it until finally I said, this just is too strange. Well, let's see what the Lord said. Lord, please confirm your word. And he did. So it's like when you're being passive as, a, as opposed to being active and studying for yourself and really testing everything as it comes. Well, I mean, the, the issue that I had with Parminder and Test, when I got the telephone call and it was said to me that we have a new leader, my antenna went up because I have never seen that this movement has any other leader save Christ. And to be told that we have a new leader, to me meant that we have switched sides. So that bothered me. When I was being told that I needed to hurry up and understand all this light that had been presented. And I needed to listen to these presentations at a, a higher speed. And I compared that with the way that Father Miller studied his scripture, where he would go no faster than he would understand a single verse. And he would consider and study on that verse until he fully understood it. That didn't say that Father Miller's method of study was going to be one of speed. So as I'm looking at this, being told that we have a new leader and that this leadership was setting aside tenets of Miller's rules, then for me, it became a problem. It became a reason that I could not follow or accept what they were saying. Now, that's my testimony on the situation. I have further ex had to examine when I'm having the word of man presented before me as being something to follow. I've had to ask the question as to what this word is. Is it according to scripture? Is it according to the spirit of prophecy? And if the answer of either of those is no, then I have to set it aside. Yeah, I agree. What I could read here is that we have a new leader is equivalent to behold your gods, the golden calves of Israel. But this has occurred already within the movement. We have many brothers and sisters that stood with us for a long time that are now no longer with us. Are we to reach out to them? Are we to reach out and begin again attending or studying within the corporate church? Or are we to present a difference, an example for those that have left, for those that are still in the corporate church, as to what this message has really meant for us and to us? One of the comments that I have made, and I made it several times, has the church not built 
a type of an image to the beast in the different vegetarian foods, the ersatz ham, the ersatz scallops, the ersatz shrimp, that they now choose to promote as being part of our diets. Where do we find these kind of situations, these type of foods listed within the Bible? You talking about the fake, fake? Um... Yeah, I am. Shrimp and stuff like that? Yeah, I am. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, what do you call phony bologna and whammy ham? Or what? Exactly. I mean, when when my family came into the Adventist Church, it was it was very much a culture shock for us, because we would be invited to other people's houses, and the meals that would be served, for the most part, would have either Loma Linda or Worthington Foods. So it wasn't Whole Foods as grown. Right. Now, I don't find anywhere in the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, that fake meat is being offered. And I know that there are many, especially yet within the church, that believe still that this should be part of our diet. When I have observed others within the church that have decided to partake of ham, that have decided to partake of crab, of lobster, of many other items and decide that God created it. So therefore it's there for us. I observe, I don't join in. It becomes a matter of prayer for me as to what type of witness that I'm actually giving and what type of witness I should give. So what kind of a witness were the children of Israel presenting before the world when they would not accept the word of God from Moses and Joshua? Were they not walking with fire of their own kindling? Were they not walking away from the path that God had led them on? Yeah, and those uh, fake meats are uh, very unhealthy, too. They're not, it's not promoting health. There's quite a bit more protein to them. There's also a lot of refinement that has gone into them. Thanks, yeah. So there's a lot here for us to consider. And I know I have, I have these things to consider as well. So. As we, as we continue through this portion We've now reached in reading the end of the first chapter of Judges. We are seeing that the children of Israel had not taken the word of the Lord to heart. 
because all they needed to do was accept God's word as it was presented and go forward in faith to conquer the land. Is the challenge that we are being presented today not that we are to go forward to lead others into the heavenly Canaan. Is God still not doing the hard work? And all we need to do is follow him by faith. We are given this work for a reason. Just as the children of Israel were given a land for a reason. For are we not to show that by obedience, that by taking God at his word, that our blessings will be innumerable, that we will be given the opportunity to represent God and his character to this, to this world at this time in earth's history. Is this not what the, the prophets of old desired to see in their time, but that we have the privilege to see this in ours? How are we to walk today, except we walk softly before our God, and we let him lead us humbly, quietly and according to his will. Any other comments or thoughts at this point? Okay. Shall we close with prayer? Mm -hmm. Loving Father, there is a lot that we do not yet understand. There is a lot that we need to take in personally to be able to give this final message to this world. Be with us each one today, Father. For there are many that have appointments, many that have divine appointments, things that you would have us to do, directions that you would have us to go. May your will be done. May your guidance be clear. May our minds be open to receiving the direction that you give, even if that direction shows us a path that we have not considered. I ask your blessing upon each one today. I thank you, Father, for this time that we've been able to spend together. Direct us now. Be with us each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.